Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think we will try to get started. Uh, our subject, uh, uh, China's climate and energy policies, is a very important one because I think, as most of you know, China is the country that is the leader in emissions of greenhouse gases, and China also consumes over half of the world's coal consumption. So what China does in the future is going to have an enormous impact on the planet. Uh, China has made some commitments under the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll hear a little more detail about that uh, and how, how, how that is going and whether it's going rapidly enough. Uh, our, our speaker is uh, David Sandelow, who has kindly come down from Columbia University, although he's a, a former longtime resident of, of D.C. Uh, at Columbia, he is the inaugural fellow of uh, the Center on Global Energy Policy, which was established there a few years ago and, and has expanded tremendously with all kinds of impressive fellows and events and speakers. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure is now a very interesting place to be. Uh, he also co-directs the Energy Environment Concentration at SEPA, the School of uh, International and Public Affairs at Columbia. And he uh, uh, is the director also of a US-China program, which I think he recently established. Uh, uh, Mr. Sandelow is uh, uh, also, uh, or was rather, a visiting professor at Tsinghua University last fall uh, when he was following up research, I think, on uh, the little book that he's going to talk mostly about today. Uh, Mr. Sandler has, has also served on, in senior positions at the White House, State Department, and Department of Energy when he was in D.C., and before going to Columbia, was actually Assistant Secretary and Acting Undersecretary of the Department of Energy. Uh, before that, he was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he has a number of publications. Uh, the one he's going to draw on today was published last year, and it's called A Guide to Chinese, Chinese uh, Climate Policy, which I believe he's going to, uh, which he, he's going to be updating on a regular basis. Uh, he has a number of other publications. I'll just take off a few. Uh, a Natural Gas Giant Awakens. Uh, geopolitics of Renewable Energy, Financing Solar and Wind Power, uh, Plug-in Electric Vehicles, and uh, further back, a book called Freedom from Oil. Uh, he was educated at U Yale College and uh, University of Michigan Law School. So, David, we welcome you. Well, thanks, Will. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for inviting me to SICE. It's, it's great to be here, see some old friends and former colleagues. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about, uh, about China and climate policy today. Um, I'm going to start um, back before most of the people in this room were born, um, uh, my first trip to China. Um, so when I was about your age, actually a little bit younger, I really wanted to travel to China. Um, I had um, uh, grown up uh, in a world in which it literally was not possible for an American citizen to travel to China. It was prohibited. We, our two countries didn't have diplomatic relations. And as a teenager, I always thought it would be fascinating to be able to go to China. It seemed very unattainable. Uh, and then uh, when I was in college, uh, uh, President, our President Jimmy Carter and, and Deng Xiaoping, leader, leader of China, normalized relations between our two countries and made it possible to uh, travel. Uh, between the two countries, um, although it took a little while and it wasn't that easy and the internet didn't exist back then, and so it wasn't that easy to find an opportunity to actually go to China. It took me a couple of years, and in the summer of 1981, I managed to find a program at this school in New York called Columbia University um, that actually had an exchange program with Hua Dong Shifan Dashui in Shanghai. Um, and, uh, and I went there and I spent the summer of 1981 in Shanghai, and it was a completely different world. Um, uh, back then than, than today. There was, there was literally one international telephone line in the entire city of Shanghai that we could use to call home. It was at the Huping, uh, find the end, the Huping, the Peace Hotel, um, and we would take a cab there every weekend, and it was the only place we could call home. And this, this is what the city 
this is what the Bund looked like back then. If you look across the river to the Bund, this is what the, the Bund looked like. This actually, this picture, as I said, is actually from 1983. I couldn't find one from 1981, but this is what it looked like that summer, and this is what the same place looks like today. Um, so, and actually, I need to update this picture because I'll step away from the mic. The Shanghai Tower is now right here. This picture is actually a few years old. Um, it's out of date. Um, but, but in, in my adult lifetime, the city of Shanghai has gone from this to that. Um, and, and that reflects just a remarkable transformation. Um, and and I, I have two observations um, about this picture, at least two observations about this contrast. W one of them is that a country that can go from this to this during my adult lifetime can do a lot of pretty amazing things. Uh, and a second observation, is that takes a lot of energy. Uh, and ch the growth in Chinese en energy consumption over the course of the past 30 years uh, has just been extraordinary. Um, particularly uh, since the year 2000, Chinese energy consumption tripled between roughly 2000 and roughly 2014. Um, just e extraordinary growth. Um, and China has extraordinary um, resource in coal. Uh, has lots and lots of cheap coal. And so a lot of that growth has been powered by um, burning of coal. And coal is um, by far the single biggest contributor to global warming. Um, when you burn coal, you put CO2 into the atmosphere and um, along with some other causes, um, the burning of coal has been the main reason for, for um, the growth of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So um, uh, China today is, as Professor, Professor Cole already said, is the leading emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. Um, it, in fact, its emissions last year exceeded those of the U.S. and Europe combined. So it's by far the biggest emitter uh, of greenhouse gas in the world. I'm gonna, I'll get to some charts on this in a minute. Um, um, uh, and, and so what China does on greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental to the future of the planet. And that's what I'll talk about today. And what I'm going to do is I'll just run through um, a book that I've published on this topic and kind of the basic ideas in the book, um, and then throw it open for discussion. I think Carla's got some comments, uh, for, and, and, then, um, and then throw it open to you um, for, a, for any discussions and comments. I'd love to have more conversation than lecture. Um, so this is a book. It's called The Guide to Chinese Climate Policy. It's a, um, you know, I start with the advertisement um, here. Um, this is, uh, there are three ways you can get this book if you're interested in this topic. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, uh, you can also download it for free, not trying to, you know, make sales or anything like that. You can download it for free from my, uh, uh, my center's website um, uh, in PDF form. And then we are maintaining its content on a more interactive website. Um, and uh, here's the URL. It's Chinese Climate Policy. Dot energypolicy dot Columbia dot edu, Chinese climate policy dot energy policy dot edu. And we're, I released this last summer, to, uh, summer 20. We're currently in the process of, of updating it, and we're going to have a revised version out uh, within a couple months uh, for the 2019 version. Um, so, and, and it's too little to see, but here's the, uh, here's the table of contents. I won't focus on that since that's, it's too small to see. Um, we cover lots of topics. And here's I'll just start with some, we have lots of charts in this that uh, visually portray some of the information that, that uh, is in the volume. Um, this I already referred to, so China's last year, 2017 emissions, here's the 2017 chart, it's roughly the same in 2018, hasn't changed much. 28% um, of global emissions of carbon dioxide. The US is 15 and, and uh, the European Union as a whole was 11%, so by far the world's largest emitter. Um, now, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for 100 years uh, or, or, or more. Um, I mean, it stays, once emitted, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a long time. So a single year of emissions does not give a good sense of the overall responsibility for global warming. Uh, and a highly relevant statistic that lots of global warming you know, uh, experts look at is what are the cumulative emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, China's contribution is 12%. Uh, or another way, another way of saying that, it's approximately correct, is of the, carbon, of the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today over base levels, 
approximately 12% of that came from China. And approximately 26% came from the United States. And approximately 24 from the European Union. So the United States, on a historic basis, it's still got a much greater responsibility than China does. Um, but by the way, that's changing. And China's emissions are so large that if they were to continue at their current pace, China would overtake the United States as the largest cumulative emitter sometime around 2040. It depends what happens. But so, you know, in, well in the lifetime of the, the professional lifetime of the students in this room, China will become the largest cumulative emitter of carbon dioxide unless it changes course and unless the world changes course on, on some of our use of energy. Another relevant statistic is uh, per capita emissions. How, how many emissions, what, what are the emissions per person? And here the United States is by far the largest um, among the major countries. There are a few smaller oil producing countries that have slightly higher emissions than the United States. Um, but the U.S. emissions are, in 2017, it's roughly the same in 2018, um, about 16 metric tons per capita, Japan at 9, and China is at 6.6. .6. Now, so Chinese emissions on average are much, much um, less than the United States. But, but two striking facts about this. First, you'll see Chinese per capita emissions are actually more than the European Union's per capita emissions. It's a stunning fact if you think back just 20 or 30 years ago um, that chi China has now become wealthy enough and its, its energy system is so carbon intensive that its per capita emissions are actually more than those in Europe today. And another relevant point is there's enormous regional disparities within China on this with much, much greater per capita emissions in the East and much, much smaller per capita emissions in the West. Uh, in the book, we, we pull together the various different estimates of Chinese emissions, um, and, and uh, there are a lot of them. The Chinese government does not regularly provide updates on its emissions. It does regularly provide updates on its electricity and um, uh, oil and gas uh, consumption, and coal oil and gas consumption, and foreign entities use that to extrapolate um, emissions data. They come up with slightly different figures, and we spent some time in this book looking at the differences in the data, and then talking about the data issues related to China, which we could get into in the question and answer if people are interested in this. Um, there's uh, a lot of questions about the quality of, of Chinese data um, in general, um, and Chinese data collecting systems are improving, but they're not up to Western standards, and there's some systematic biases in some of the data um, which are relevant when you think about it, when you're trying to figure out what's going on with respect to energy and climate change. I thought this was interesting. We found this graph, and th this shows on the, on the bottom, on the x-axis, these are years, if you can't see it, starting in 1951 into the present. And then the, on the y-axis is temperature. Um, and this is average temperature in China, and what, what, what this shows is that average temperature in China since 1951, kind of around the time of the revolution, right after the revolution, um, has, has gone up by uh, two and a half degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is actually more than the global average. It's interesting. Um, the global average temperature in, in that period has not increased that much. So, so temperatures are actually increasing faster in China, according to this data, than they are on a global average basis. Um, I, I've been reaching out to some Chinese scientists to see whether anyone has, has explanation or theories about this. I, I, don't, I haven't seen kind of solid theories. One possibility is that as China has urbanized, um, temperatures have increased. There's an urban heat island effect, and cities tend to be warmer than the countryside, and so this could just be a product of urbanization, uh, or there could be some other factors at play. I, I'm not sure. But, but temperatures in China uh, are increasing, and, and that, I think, it relates to a larger point about climate change in China, which is China is extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Um, and one of the ways that is most vulnerable is from sea level rise. Um, you know, China has hundreds of millions of people living right up against the sea coast. Uh, there are 550 million people living in coastal provinces in China. In fact, this is um, kind of interesting statistic. I think the, the U.S. and China, the United States and China, have almost exactly the same land area 
by, co by coincidence, just by coincidence. It's like they're about 1 or 2% apart. They're almost exactly the same size. China has four times as many people, uh, and almost all those people live in the eastern third of the country. So, you know, the eastern part of China is basically 12 times as densely populated as the United States. And I, had, I remember I uh, was taking a, a, a car in from Shanghai, airport in Shanghai, sometime in the past year or two, and I realized we've been driving for 45 minutes, and the entire way the population density of the buildings was like midtown Manhattan. And for, you know, for those I've seen, it's like maybe a number of Chinese students here, you're very familiar with that if you grew up in those areas. For Americans, it's you know, much more unusual to see just that incredibly dense population. That just, it's, like, it's like if you went from here to Dulles Airport and the entire way had the density of midtown Manhattan. And that's, that's what Shanghai and many, and many parts of eastern China are like. And a lot of that is right up against the ocean. Um, and so this, this slide is a projection of what that area of Shanghai that I showed earlier will look like after two degrees C of warming. That's but for the Americans in the audience, that's 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And most the, the, the scary fact about this is if you talk to, to climate change experts, I think most experts today say we are unlikely to avoid this amount of warming. It's the, goal, it's, the, it's the goal that the international community has adopted to try to prevent this amount of warming, but we are absolutely not on a track to do that right now as a world. So we are likely to experience two degrees C of warming above pre-industrial levels. And this is what the Bund in Shanghai will look like in terms of water intrusion if seawalls aren't built uh, after two degrees C of warming. So it's going to be a huge need to protect that infrastructure with expensive seawalls and other types of measures. Um, and then this is what a projection of what this area will look like after four degrees, and it, which is, uh, what, 7.6, I think, 7.6 degrees uh, F. And this is not an impossible world. We could experience this. Um, and one of the real risks of, of this type of sea level rise isn't just what happens every day as a result of the sea coming in, but storms in particular. And there's very, very big vulnerability to storm surges as a result of sea level rise like this. So this is one type of vulnerability that China faces um, uh, as a result of, of climate change. There are many others. And the um, uh, uh, Chinese government um, has an adaptation program, a climate adaptation program, which dates back about five years now, a big program of the National Academy of Sci the Chinese Academy of Sciences and others to look at how China is going to adapt to climate change. Um, but there's enormous, enormous vulnerability in China uh, to the impacts of climate change. I should say, too, what one, one, of the, one of the impacts of climate change that is most worrying is that storms become more intense and more frequent. And we've seen that in the United States. Um, and China has historically been devastated by a lot of by typhoons um, and uh, it's a history of very severe storms with that type of severe weather patterns. Uh, could, is a big, big potential impacts on China. Um, so I've already talked about coal some. Coal is the leading um, energy source in China by far. We talk about this in the book and talk about what Chinese policies are with respect to um, reducing coal consumption. The Chinese government um, has had a extremely ambitious uh, program to phase out coal now. Um, for a number of years, to, to reduce coal consumption for many, many years. It's driven um, by a number of factors. The leading one is the horrific air pollution in Chinese cities right now. And um, you know, I, I re a couple of years ago, I was in a restaurant and I, I, in Beijing, and I told a, a waitress there that I was going down to Hainan Island, which is in the south. It was, it was really cold. It was the middle of the winter. And I said, I'm going down to Hainan Island. I'm really looking forward to it. And she said, oh, you're so lucky. And I expected her to say, oh, you're so lucky because it's so warm down there. And she said, no, you're so lucky there's no PM 2.5 down there. Um, and that won't be surprising for the Chinese people who grew up in China in the audience, because everybody in China is talking about PM 2.5. You check on your apps what the PM 2.5 levels are. Um, I think most Americans probably don't know what PM 2.5 is. And PM 2.5 is a measure of local air pollution. Um, and you know, uh, there's this horrific air pollution in many, many Chinese cities, and it's caused mostly by coal, some, some diesel burning and, and some dust from agriculture is also part of the cause, but, um, but coal is the single biggest factor. And so the Chinese government has had very, very ambitious programs to, fa to reduce coal consumption with closing of small coal plants, um, improving efficiency, 
um, and, and other measures. One way it's done that is by transitioning from coal to natural gas. Um, China has, um, it's interesting, China is uh, have the biggest in almost everything, biggest coal consumer, biggest solar power produced consumer, um, uh, biggest greenhouse gas emitter. One place really in the energy world that China is not the biggest is natural gas. China actually has used less natural gas than many other major countries for many years, and that's because the domestic resource has been hard to develop. Um, but the Chinese government is very committed to building up its natural gas imports as well as its domestic production in order to fight local air pollution, uh, principally diversify its energy sources and, uh, and fight global, and fight global, global warming. Um, uh, China has tremendous solar resource. Um, China, for, since, uh, for at least uh, 10 years or more, has been the leading manufacturer of solar panels in the world. Um, uh, about five years ago, China also, uh, the Chinese government as a matter of policy, started promoting the um, deployment of solar panels in China. And last year, more than half of the solar panels deployed in the world were deployed in China. Um, uh, this is making a big difference when it comes to the fight against emissions and global warming. It's, it's, it's still small, but it's growing a lot. But one, China faces a number of challenges from a policy standpoint with respect to solar. Even though lots of solar panels are being built, some of them are not being used. And that problem is called curtailment. And there's high levels of curtailment in China. And it has to do with the way that power is dispatched in the Chinese system. Um, and, uh, and often coal plants have the priority when it comes to electricity over solar in China. And that's been a real challenge. They also, number of instances with, with solar power in which big solar plants have been built, but literally the transmission lines have not been built to come out to the solar uh, facility. And it takes a while before the, the transmission lines get out and can get the power to cities. Uh, China has, uh, is leading the world in wind power, um, massive, massive construction of wind power and great wind resources. In lots of the country, we have maps in the book of, of wind resources and is the biggest hydropower developer in the world. I said China's the biggest in almost everything. Um, the biggest hydropower uh, facility in the world, the Three Gorges Dam, uh, is, is in China. Um, and China continues to develop new hydropower. You know, here in the United States, we've basically developed all of our hydropower potential. We did that about 50 years ago. And we can, we can get a little bit more hydropower by switching out some of the old turbines for new turbines that are more efficient in the United States. But we don't have much capacity to increase hydropower in the United States. In China, there's still plenty of capacity, um, and, and that's underway. Um, and, oh, and, and this is, by the way, it's mostly, as this map you can show, it's mostly in the south part of China. Uh, southern, there's some hydropower north, but it's mostly in the southern part of China, which has lots of water and lots of hills. Um, Nuclear power is still relatively small um, in China today. About th between three and four percent of the nuclear power in China is uh, of, the, of the electric power in China is nuclear. But um, a third of the nuclear power plants under construction in the world today are in China. So uh, China is very much committed to building up its nuclear power fleet. Um, is is doing that is becoming a major force in the global civil nuclear power sector. This has a big impact in reducing emissions. If you build a nuclear plant instead of a coal plant, you're reducing emissions dramatically. And then electric vehicles. So, um, uh, and actually, so this is a 2017 slide. We're just updating this. As I said, 2018, this will be different. The, so in 2017, China was 40% of the electric vehicles in the world. 2018, it's 50% of the electric vehicles in the world. China is, the Chinese government is deeply committed to deploying electric vehicles, um, has had a range of programs to do that, um, subsidies for manufacturers, subsidies for buyers, and actually the um, uh, municipal governments in China um, have policies with license plates that promote um, electric vehicle adoption. It's very similar, in the United States a lot, we have high occupancy vehicle lanes that you can go in if you have two or more riders, or often if you're an electric vehicle. And there's similar types of policies in China with license plates to promote the uh, buying of electric vehicles. 
And um, another interesting feature of China's response to global warming is with f forestry. So for those of the people who can, if you go to the cities in China and spend time, particularly in the eastern cities, you don't experience the pretty extensive forest cover, particularly in the southeast of China, and some in the, way in the north. It's, it's really cold up in the far north part. But, um, but actually, I, f I flew out of the city of Xiamen a little while ago, in, which is in the southeast of China. And flying out of Xiamen, it was like, probably we were an hour flying out of the city with just forest the whole way. Just um, huge, huge forest cover, as you can see on this map. And China has had very ambitious governmental programs to increase forest cover, um, to fight desertification, um, and, and, uh, and for some to assist agriculture and for watershed purposes. And this makes a big difference from a global warming standpoint. One of the cheapest ways you can mitigate climate change is by growing trees and soaking up the carbon. Um, so this is, uh, and the Chinese government talks about this as part of their global warming policy. So then a final feature of, um, that I would talk about here on, on China's climate change policy is the Belt and Road. So, um, so the Belt and Road Initiative um, is uh, the largest infrastructure initiative in history. Okay? It, is, um, it is really the umbrella framework for Xi Jinping's foreign policy. And it's going to be in the news next week. Next week is the second Belt and Road Summit. Um, the first one was two years ago. Um, and in Beijing, President Xi Jinping will be hosting Vladimir Putin, hosting a um, number of other heads of state. La the, last, the first Belt and Road Summit attracted 28 heads of state. Um, so it's a uh, um, huge initiative. And energy is a huge part of it. Um, and there is increasing dialogue about how coal-fired power plants are being supported under the Belt and Road Initiative with very adverse impacts when it comes to climate change. Um, and there are, according to some counts, more than 200 coal-fired power plants under construction in the world today with some degree of Chinese involvement. Um, and, uh, and that is locking in emissions that will be here for many, many years. Uh, so it's a very, a very big issue when it comes to climate change. Um, and. Uh, uh, and, and one that um, is, is happening really all over the world. So in the last chapter of this book, I, I offer f kind of five conclusions about Chinese climate change policy, and I'll just run through them now um, and tell you my thinking and then um, uh, listen to any thoughts and comments. So the first conclusion that I offer is the Chinese government is taking significant steps to address climate change. Um, and I point to a number of different steps the Chinese government is taking. First, cutting coal and scaling up low-carbon alternatives. And I've talked about that already. The Chinese government has got really pretty ambitious policies to do both those things. Um, and by the way, there's, well, I'll interrupt myself to go into the next one. This, this, um, uh, one of those ambitious policies is carbon pricing. Um, now, you know, in the United States um, and in Western economies, economists are always saying carbon pricing is what we need to fight global warming. It's the most efficient, most effective policy. Um, the Chinese government is committed to a policy of carbon pricing. It's had pilot programs for carbon emissions trading since 2013, 2014 in about seven provinces. And last year announced a nationwide program for carbon pricing in the power sector. So there are serious steps to adopt carbon pricing in China. It's going pretty slowly. And it's not clear how much of an impact it's going to have, but the Chinese government has a mechanism in place to start actually putting a price on the emissions of carbon. Lots of other policies, um, including energy efficiency policies, others I haven't had a chance to mention, including green cities policies. Chinese government is deeply committed to green cities, uh, and clean cities, and um, lots of other policies in this area. The Chinese government's headline goal with respect to climate change is its 2030 peaking goal. And what that was announced in the context of the Paris Climate Agreement, and actually before that, a meeting with President Obama. Um, and, and the idea is China says, the Chinese government says that we will um, not increase carbon dioxide emissions after 2030, that that's going to be our peak. Um, and it, China, Chinese, gov Chinese government is absolutely going to meet that goal. It, it, it will probably be able to meet that goal uh, in the first half of the next decade. Um, and there's a dialogue in the kind of climate change community about whether or not this is kind of about this goal. Some people say, oh, it's not ambitious enough. China should have proposed a more ambitious goal. And the Chinese government's response is, yes, but uh, 
at the time that we are peaking our emissions, our GDP per capita is going to be roughly half of where the United States GDP per capita was when the United States peaked emissions. And so we're at a much lower level of development agreeing to peak our emissions. Um, so um, the 2030 peaking goal is, it's a serious commitment. It's a commitment internationally uh, that helped to make the Paris Climate Agreement a reality. Um, and I think it, it's part of the package uh, the Chinese government has adopted to fight climate change. And then public messaging. So there's no climate deniers in China, or at least uh, none that have any influence in government, I should say. There's, I'm sure there's some climate deniers. There's, there's none that have any influence on Chinese policy. Um, uh, Chinese government has been clear uh, that it believes climate change is real. Um, that it's working to address the challenge, that there it, it is obviously there are other issues that, it's, that are part of the policy mix, but the climate change is real and it's part of what needs to be addressed. And it's, there's actually a, a growing large community committed to fighting climate change and, um, and promoting clean energy throughout all different walks of Chinese life. A second observation that I make in my conclusion is that Chinese policies have multiple objectives. Um, and that that's a strength from the standpoint of climate mitigation. One thing I often hear in talking about climate change policy is some people will say, yeah, but that's not really intended to fight climate change, it's intended to fight local air pollution. And my reaction to that is that's a good thing. That, or, or what, well, that, that if it's intended to fight local air pollution as well as fight global warming, um, as well as help promote economic growth, and it's a constellation of policies that are being, uh, objectives that are being promoted, then that policy will be more enduring. And I think that global warming policies around the world in many different countries often have multiple objectives, and the more that they're wrapped into um, a broad-based set of objectives, the more enduring they're likely to be. So, um, uh, point number three, China's governance systems have strengths and weaknesses when it comes to addressing climate change. So, um, the one, the strength that, that, that strikes me the most in Chinese governance system is, is the culture of planning in China. You know, China, Chinese government is currently on its 13th five-year plan um, and uh, is, is working on its 14th five-year plan. In contrast here in the United States, when we get a one-year appropriations bill passed, we celebrate it, right? So there's a real dis, you know, uh, difference. And for a long-term issue like um, climate change or some of the transition in energy sector that's required to address climate change, this type of planning makes a big difference. And, and actually, the Chinese government will set in its five-year plan targets for things like energy use and emissions. And then, um, now those targets are um, not always hit, but, they're, but they serve as a guide for policy making in the provinces and the central government. Um, and they have an impact. Um, and actually, the, and the Chinese government, in a number of instances that I've been aware of, has been quite candid about saying, we got almost all the way, but we didn't get all the way to hitting this goal, and we're revising the pl our next plan in light of this. But that type of long-term planning tool, I think, is extremely important and helpful in separate conversation that's missing in this country. At the same time, China's system has some real weaknesses when it comes to fighting climate change. One of them um, is, uh, is a, la a lack of enf uh, enforcement culture. Um, and uh, particularly in the legal system. And um, there are many, many stories about uh, scrubbers, for example, being installed to fight local air pollution on Chinese coal plants. And as soon as the inspector leaves, they get turned off. Um, and, uh, and there's um, not a tradition of compliance with laws in the same way in China that we have in, in the United States. There's, um, there's I, I read somebody who wrote that one contrast between the U.S. system and the Chinese system is the following, that in the United States, it's extremely hard to pass a law. You know, getting anything through our Congress is almost impossible. Um, and getting anything through Congress and signed by the president, you know, even harder. So passing a law is really hard. But once we pass a law, we've got pretty good systems for making sure that they're implemented and, and enforced. We, um, we have a culture that does that. We have court systems that do that. We have regulatory officials that do that. And then in China, it's somewhat the opposite. It's much easier to pass laws in China, um, but then just because a law is on the books in China it doesn't necessarily mean that it's being followed. And so that's one reason that in my book I look not just at what are the stated policies, but what's actually happening, and then compare all of them. So 
I think that's a real weakness when it comes to the Chinese systems uh, addressing climate change. Another one is this is being addressed, but Chinese statistical systems are not nearly as good as Western statistical systems. Um, I mentioned this earlier, there's both just kind of basic technical issues in terms of data collection, but there's also some systematic biases in Chinese data systems, and um, particularly local officials who have promotion, who have an incentive, to often have an incentive to inflate various figures uh, in order to be promoted, and that skews some of the data. So Chinese statistical systems are not nearly as good as the United States, and that, that's a challenge of fighting climate change. So Chinese governance system has both strengths and weaknesses when it comes to fighting climate change. Some Chinese policies run counter to climate change goals. Um, there are two. One of them is, uh, that I highlight, one of them is synthetic natural gas. This is a somewhat technical issue, but you can make gas, natural gas from coal. Um, you literally take, you know, take the coal and with various chemical and, and heat and pressure uh, forces, um, turn coal into natural gas. Um, if you do that, you can ship the natural gas into cities and burn it cleanly, and that's good for air pollution in those cities, but it's terrible from a global warming standpoint. It increases the amount of energy that you use, uh, and it increases the emissions of carbon dioxide that go into the atmosphere. This is a small industry in China. It hasn't taken off for reasons related to cost and water availability. It requires a lot of water. Um, but the Chinese government has sought to promote it, and it runs counter to global warming goals. And then second one, overseas coal-fired power plants. I talked about this when I talked about the Belt and Road Initiative, but this is the big one. Chinese promotion of overseas coal-fired power plants are really running counter to global efforts to fight climate change. And my last conclusion, uh, China, like all major emitters, will need to do more for the world to achieve its climate goals. And, and you know, I guess I can't emphasize this enough. The world is not even remotely on track um, to meeting climate change goals. If, for those of you who follow this issue or are interested, last year the world's leading scientists, the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with a report called the, it's called the 1.5 degree C report. Um, and it sends a pretty powerful message about how off track we are in terms of meeting the challenge of climate change. The Paris Agreement was definitely a step forward. The Paris Agreement was exciting in that it riveted kind of the world's attention on this issue, brought together, the, it was actually the largest gathering of heads of state ever outside of New York came together to take on this issue. So pretty impressive in terms of the political will there. Um, but the, and, and pledges that helped to solve this problem, helped to move us in the right direction. But since the Paris Agreement, lots of countries are missing their Paris pledges, and the Paris pledges themselves aren't nearly enough. So we really have to reorient um, major elements of our energy systems in the decades ahead in order to address this problem. We're not doing it as a globe. China is the world's largest emitter. Is, it's moving in some respects in the right direction, but just like the United States and Europe and Japan and really all parts of the world, China's going to need to do more to solve this problem. Um, uh, so. Here's the book, um, and if I should, I, I will end actually where I began by saying, you know, let's see if I, oh, I won't run all the way back to those two early slides of Shanghai, but but I, I want to end by saying, you know, a, a country that can go from you know nothing in Shanghai to what I just what I showed in terms of the incredible power in Shanghai in, the, in my adult lifetime can do some amazing things. And for those people who are pessimistic about our ability to meet climate change, I just point you to that type of change. I, th I think that with the type of commitment that I've seen in lots of places and with the interest of young people in this room, I, I think we can solve this problem. Thanks. Uh, before we have a general discussion, uh, I've asked our, our SAIS colleague, Carla Freeman, to uh, maybe make some comments. Uh, Carla is an associate research uh, professor in China studies here, and also is director currently of our Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, she's uh, done current research on China uh, and the global commons, uh, China, Chinese foreign policy, and uh, Chinese China's uh, non-traditional security policies. And I happen to know has taught courses on, on China environmental policies in the past. Uh, she has a PhD and an MA from SAIS, uh, also a certificate from Sciences Po in Paris, 
and I think one or two certificates in Chinese language studies. And she's currently a chief editor uh, of an academic journal called Asian Perspectives. Uh, and I think in the past she has done some early work on researching uh, China's carbon markets. So maybe she'll say one or two things about that, please. Well, uh, thank you, David, very much for that wonderful talk and also for your uh, really impressive contribution. Um, uh, will has lent me his copy, but I think I may buy my own uh, as well. And, and thank you, Will, so much for inviting me to comment. Um, I actually am also a Yale undergraduate. I, I don't know if we overlap, but we'll have to find that out. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I'm really old these days. Um, anyway, um, yes, that was, a, that was a wonderful talk, and I think it reflects the book's uh, perspective on uh, on China's environmental policy as it's evolved, as well as its climate policy. And I thought I'd make five points or so, uh, drawing on, uh, on following uh, David's remarks. Um, first, uh, and also my own interests, uh, first, what are the drivers of some of these changes? And, and toward the end of, of David's remarks, he started to address this. And I see uh, uh, the evolution of China's uh, climate policy very much as an inter the interplay of uh, domestic and, and international factors. And uh, you can go back to uh, the China's 11th five-year plan, uh, which, is, uh, which was launched in around 2006, when China uh, launched its, its renewable energy laws. And at that point, uh, if you were trying to understand you know, what, what was driving that, uh, a principal factor might have been uh, concerns about energy security, and in part because China's energy usage was soaring, and, uh, and it's, uh, en the energy intensity Density of producing a unit of GDP was 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 really really high, uh, and so one of the motives for for that policy was to uh, to try to reduce the 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 energy to pr intensity of production, and uh, and and China really started to push uh, renewables. I think in in large part uh, not because of concerns about climate, uh, but uh, really uh, because of concerns about energy security in part. Uh, but by 2006 or so, uh, China had become the world's largest carbon emitter and was starting to receive the uh, world's opprobrium for uh, this, this new uh, designation as the world's sort of climate superpower, emitting superpower, and, uh, and, and started to be uh, concerned about that. So there was some inter international pressure uh, at work in, in driving uh, China's climate policies. And at the same time, uh, China started to have a lot of uh, its cities started to have a lot of air pollution events. Uh, so this, this connection between air pollution and uh, climate change, uh, that started to come together fairly early. There was another international factor that also shaped China's uh, environmental policies and drove them, and that was that Beijing was going to host the 2008 Olympics. And so uh, looking more green was really important to, to China. Uh, so there's always been this, this interplay uh, between domestic and, and international policy, and uh, one of the, of course, the driving, uh, the, ch the drivers of, of change was that you had an Obama administration for which David worked, uh, with, uh, which was very interested in cooperating with China on climate change. And so uh, a meeting uh, between Xi Jinping and, and uh, President Obama was very important in, uh, in 2009 and in sort of shifting uh, uh, the direction of climate policy. And, and uh, even though Copenhagen seemed like a disaster, that was really a turning point. And after that, uh, the two countries started to work together uh, more uh, closely, and uh, that led to the Paris Agreement. Um, David also mentioned planning, and that's really important uh, in the Chinese system. Uh, all of this, uh, no matter what the drivers are, it all gets channeled into the five-year plan. And I mentioned the 11th five-year plan, but there have been a series of five-year plans that have integrated uh, climate change policies into them. And most, uh, the current five-year plan is the, is the most uh, climate important plan this, uh, that, that the China's had. Um, but uh, even though you might, the, the plans might uh, introduce very ambitious targets, uh, the challenge is always, as David said, enforcement uh, in China. Uh, China's really good at implementing stuff and building stuff, uh, but when it comes to uh, making sure that uh, people are doing what they're supposed to, I think you've all heard about, heard the saying, uh, uh, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away in China. So there's this big challenge in implementation. And so China has tried to figure out how to deal with that in a number of ways. And the two uh, principal ways, uh, 
sort of crudely to, to, to provide two principal ways. One is by introducing market mechanisms to solve some of these problems in the environmental arena. Uh, and the other is, uh, is to deal with this administratively and bureaucratically. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I will mention that I've done some work on, on China's carbon markets. Uh, and, uh, and that seemed like an area of opportunity for China to work on to try to uh, address some of its, its, uh, its, uh, its emissions challenges and reduce its emissions in the system. And uh, and so as as uh, David mentioned, uh, in uh, in uh, well, in around 2013, start China started to develop, de develop a carbon market uh, with uh, in introducing the market as it always does uh, all of its policies through pilot projects, seven different uh, pilots around China, uh, uh, five cities and two provinces. And I had a chance to visit all of those uh, merging uh, carbon markets at the time, and they, uh, it was really unclear whether they would, uh, would, would get anywhere at all, uh, partly because uh, China has you know, only partially developed e energy markets, and maybe, uh, maybe David can address that a little bit. Uh, that remains a problem. But China did soft launch uh, a national uh, emissions trading system in 2017. And the question will be whether it can make the additional changes, changes to the China's uh, energy pricing system, uh, some uh, needs to do some legal remediations and some other things to get this, this carbon market off the ground. Uh, but it is the world's largest carbon market and has potential to link up uh, to, uh, to uh, Europe, uh, Europe's uh, carbon market, as well as California's. And in fact, uh, Governor Brown has been uh, a big champion of, of staying connected to China, uh, even as the U.S.-China relationship has uh, be become increasingly tense, uh, because there, there are uh, huge gains. If you really care about climate change, uh, you, should, you should care about what happens in, in China. Uh, the other, the other thing that China tool that China uses is an, administra an administrative approach is to remedying, uh, you know, some of these uh, environmental challenges and. Um, and uh, and so uh, it it uh, it has uh, made some major reforms in the past few years. Uh, tried to get uh, to improve uh, problems with enforcement. For example, making Chinese cadres accountable for the environment in their localities, uh, and has been has been uh, if they want to get promoted, they have to behave be better environmental cadres. Uh, so that's that's one one tool. Another tool is that that China has. Uh, has reformed its uh, its uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection, which was a very very weak uh, agency in China, uh, and has created this new Ministry of Ecological Environment, uh, and that uh, got off the ground in 2018. Uh, it is possibly a good thing that uh, climate policy was moved to the MEE, but it's not clear because previously the National Development and Reform Commission, which was is China's super ministry responsible for development, was the leading uh, the, the, the the center of of climate policy in China. And suddenly you have this new agency, the MEE, uh, responsible that doesn't. Uh, China always linked climate and development together, and now uh, it's uh, it climate. Uh, in, uh, policy is now uh, environmental policy. That could be a good thing, but it's not clear. Uh, it would be lovely to talk more about that. Um, and then I, the fifth point I wanted to address is uh, is, uh, is BRI and uh, the, the to this, this issue that uh, David mentioned about the BRI and, and whether or not the Belt and Road Initiative is going to be a green initiative. Uh, Ch China, of course, alongside its rollout of the Belt and Road Initiative, launched its own de uh, development bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and that's supposed to be uh, green and uh, but lean, green and mean. Uh, and it's unclear, though, just how gr uh, green it's going to be. It's already apparent, uh, re received a lot of criticism for funding a, um, a project in Myanmar that uh, uh, is a coal, uh, uh, project and as David mentioned, uh, there are a lot of other coal uh, uh, burnt coal uh, plants that are part of the BRI scheme, and so it's not at all clear. Uh, one area that I don't know that much about, but I suspect many in the audience would be interested in, and I know it's include some discussion is included in this report, is uh, green finance. 
uh, because if you want to, if there's any way to, uh, to, to green the BRI, it would be to make China's development banks that are financing uh, the, these massive projects uh, really adhere to green, uh, green uh, standards. And uh, there, these are all, these, these uh, green finance standards are, in, are incorporated into the BRI, but uh, in, in these development banks, both the China Development Bank and the Exim Bank, uh, but it's unclear uh, just how, uh, how, how, how much, how green uh, they're, 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 uh, they'll ultimately uh, be when they, uh, they finance these projects. Uh, the big challenge for China uh, is lack of transparency. Uh, and so that makes it, that's, it makes it very tough uh, to, to have efficient markets. Uh, and it makes it very tough uh, to uh, ensure that projects uh, across its borders, let alone inside China, are, are climate friendly. So I'll just stop there and look forward to discussion. Thank you. Uh, floor is open for comments or questions. I uh, would ask that you just uh, briefly introduce yourself. Professor Upalin in the back. Uh, thank you. My name is Johannes Urpelan, and I'm the director of the Energy Resources and Environment Program and a former colleague of David's at uh, Columbia University. So, David, you mentioned in your presentation that China has a set of policies that are uh, counterproductive when it comes to uh, dealing with climate change. And I wanted to hear your take on uh, the issue of uh, this public credit that the Chinese government is making available to uh, especially industrial producers in China. So about three years ago, there was an effort by the Chinese government to move into a more service and innovation oriented economy and reduce reliance on heavy industry. Then they backtracked when they saw the results, inflation, big political pushback, and all that. And this year, certainly, the numbers are kind of scary with 80% increase in public credit available to, to some of the industrial sectors. So to what extent do you think that this is a problem that is fueling these things like the push of coal-fired power plants uh, through the Belt and Road? Can artificially create demand for sectors that are not doing well? And then second, do you, if, if you agree with that statement, do you think the Chinese government will be able to get a handle on this in the next uh, three to five years? Um, <clears throat> Hi, Johannes. We wish we were back at Columbia. Um, uh, it's a great question. Um, I, uh, there, there is a lot of... Um, a lot of commentary to the effect that one of the principal drivers for the Belt and Road Initiative is finding outlets for excess capacity in industrial sectors in, in China. And excess capacity is, by the way, a feature of lots of Chinese, um, uh, lots of Chinese economy. Um, partly, and I'm, I'm not an economist, but was, um, uh, others can comment on this, but, but uh, I understand it in part by a lack of market discipline that we're used to here in the United States. I mean, in, in, in uh, for example, in, um, in the U.S. Uh, power sector, if there's significant overcapacity, then there is, um, you know, companies go into bankruptcy and they go out of business. And in China, that's much less likely to happen. Um, and and the, di the, the financial disciplines just aren't there. And that's true across a range of areas. And most relevant for carbon emitting infrastructure, that's true for power generation, it's true for heavy uh, industry like iron and steel um, and, and the chemical sector. And, um, uh, and, and the Belt and Road uh, Initiative clearly serves the purpose of assisting with finding markets um, for, for some of that excess capacity. Now, um, there is also excess capacity in some low carbon emitting sectors in China, for most notably in solar power panel generation. So the significant overcapacity there in the Belt and Road you know, Initiative does help to promote some of those as well. But um, the, um, you know, to, and a related topic on the Belt and Road Initiative, there, there is something called the Guidance to Promoting the Green Belt and Road, which is a guidance document that's put out by four Chinese ministries, basically. It's by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Environment at the time, Ministry of Commerce, and NDRC. And, and the first time I read that guidance to a green belt and road, I, I read it again. I thought, you know, I thought to myself, this reads like it was written by Greenpeace. You know, it's, it's, it uses language and terminology that 
in the United States we would associate with the kind of far left, um, about promoting ecological civilization and, and, and this type of thing. And so the aspirations that are contained within this document, which is an official policy document of important parts of the Chinese government, is very, very green and very, very low carbon. And, um, and then it, it gets back to the issue of how, are the, how is that implemented? And there are not good mechanisms within the Chinese system right now for translating those intentions into actual results on the ground. Hi, I'm. Hi. Um, can, can oh, sorry. Oh, you can you can go if you get, if you want. <laughs> Uh, I think it'll be quick here. I'm Gavin Bate. I'm an energy reporter here in D.C. Thank you guys very much for the informal, uh, for the very informative presentation here. Um, I had a question about China's internal climate goals. Um, so we saw last year, I think it was around September, there were a number of reports that came out saying that people had analyzed some satellite photos of certain uh, specific sites in China, and they had said, well, it doesn't look like China is actually keeping up with their uh, their goal to cap carbon emissions in 2030. In in fact, a lot of these power plants that were supposed to not be completed or not being or or not be built are being built and we can see this because we're looking at you know researchers look at these satellite photos from all around China. Um, I wondered if you guys could speak a little bit more to that. I had read that there was a little bit of tension between the central government and some of the regional power uh, companies there. Uh, can you give us a little bit more information about the dynamics internally in China about how well that whether they will or will not actually peak their coal use uh, soon and peak in 2030? Want to start? No, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, I think both of the points you were making are, are uh, consistent with what I've read and what I understand. That is, that is one, um, coal plant construction is continuing in China. You, I mean, it's, it's in the official statistics. There, um, some, and that's despite the very strong pol policies to discourage the construction of new coal plants. So why is that happening? Partly, I think it's. There, there are two things. One of them is there's a time lag, that some of the coal plants that are just coming online and being commissioned were actually started three or four years ago um, and are just coming online. I th uh, so they're at the end of the pipeline. And then the other is what Professor Freeman was saying about, you know, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away, that Beijing may have policies that discourage local coal plant construction or, uh, um, or coal plant construction, but um, uh, in the provinces, officials have incentives to have them go forward, those coal plants go forward. And so there's a tension there and some coal plants are managing to be built notwithstanding that. So I think there is clearly con not a total stop on coal plant construction in China. It, it does continue, although at a much slower rate than it was, say, 10 years ago. Um, but that said, you asked about the 2030 peaking goal. I, I think all experts that I've seen believe that China is going to meet its 2030 peaking goal, notwithstanding what I was just saying. Um, in fact, I think the consensus view I've read among Western experts is going to meet it very early, that it's likely to meet in the beginning of the 2020s. And so then the dialogue becomes, well, shouldn't China have committed to a more stringent goal? But, but, uh, but the, and I'm not, a, I'm not a modeler, so I don't have my own really independent view of this. I'm just kind of reporting what others I read say. And I think that my, just to repeat, my, my, my uh, read is that the con consensus is China's likely to meet that goal. I, I wouldn't. I, I, I couldn't have answered uh, that question, but I, I just I think on top of uh, those comments, it even though uh, to your point about whether China will peak its coal by 2030 or not, uh, it, China actually did see its uh, I believe its its coal use in its primary energy mix uh, decline below 60 percent. Uh, uh, for the first time to 59 percent. The target is 58 by 2020. When I see that sort of decline right before the, the target date, I get a little suspicious, but it looks like it'll meet, meet the 58 percent target by 2020 as well. Hi, Kenneth Dubin, uh, Energy Information Administration. My question was actually pretty similar to the gentleman's back there, but more specifically with coal. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the 2030 peaking target was a CO2 peak, is that correct? In the uh, 13th five-year plan, there was also a coal peaking target of 1,100 gigawatts in 2020. And the China Electricity right. Council has come out and said, they're probably gonna blow by that, not peak coal until 2030, and 
closer to 1,300, and they're planning on building 290 gigawatts, more than the current U.S. coal fleet just in the next decade. So do you think that seems reasonable, the, uh, like a 1,300 gigawatt peaking coal and not until 2030? Reasonable in terms of protecting um, the global climate, we hopefully could do, you know, fewer is better, right? So The central yeah. government, as you said, in yeah. the five-year plan is usually pretty close, if not right on, to meeting their target. And here's an example of where they're probably not going to come close to that that target. And so I'm not sure on those uh, on on those particular numbers, but the the uh, it was a the, the goal in the 13th fire plan was I think not to exceed right with the, right. That there that there would never be more than that right right and now it does seem like that will be exceeded right okay yeah. Hi, I'm Jonas Nam. I'm a professor in the ERE program here. Um, and so if I were uh, trying to be argumentative, I would say that uh, you sort of outlined a lot of climate policies, but all of them are really economic policies. And so I wonder if you could tell me your sort of take on how much of this is climate policy that happens to, or economic policy that sort of happens to have a climate benefit, and how, if, is there sort of an intrinsic motivation? Um, I. Uh, I think yes, these are economic policies that have a uh, climate benefit, and yes, there's an intrinsic motivation. That, that I think um, um, one one um, uh, goal that climate advocates have in many places around the world is to embed climate policies in other policies. That climate doesn't stand alone. In fact, in many ways, that's what the the Green New Deal does. That right, the Green New Deal, which is getting so much attention in Washington D.C. Um, and is as um, increase the amount of dialogue around climate change in this in this city and around and around this country. Uh, it really says climate policy is part of a broader set of policies for promoting social justice, for promoting social economic growth, um, and and in in China, I think um, uh, you look at a policy like an elect electric vehicles policy. Okay, now electric vehicle policy helps to fight local air pollution. It helps to reduce oil imports. Um, it, it helps to position China uh, as a leader in an industry of the future, and it helps to promote deep decarbonization of the transport sector. It does all those things. So um, uh, the Chinese government is very clear in when it's talking about its global warming policy that um, electric vehicle policies, you know, are part of its package, uh, are part of the package. So, so it's. You know, it's, it's part of a combination. So, I, um, so in the way I frame it in the book, which I talked about here, is that many Chinese climate policies have multiple goals, and and that that's, you know, that that that's actually a good thing when it comes to if if you care about fighting climate change. Um, then the only other point I make is, um, uh, you know, one interesting exercise then is go around and can look for policies that have most, you know, where where climate seems to be the principal objective. And carbon pricing would seem to be in that category, right? If 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 your objectives were solely in other areas, you probably wouldn't use carbon pricing as a tool. And you know, the the Chinese government has been, you know, uh, out in front uh, in terms of trying to put in place a carbon pricing scheme. It's pretty complicated in their system, and whether it's actually going to have an impact is not clear. But but they're moving forward on carbon pricing. That, that was sort of the the, the question I. I yeah. You know, to what extent do we see climate policies that are sort of cutting against growth um, ever in this context? Because it's very clear that we do lots of things in China that are pushing growth and are terrible for the climate also, right? So it's sort of, but you answered it. Thank you. Right, no, and, and economic growth is clearly the prime imperative, right? Okay. Um, Doug Hengel, an adjunct professor here at SAIS and a former colleague of David's from uh, previous administration. Two questions. One, how do the Chinese think about carbon capture? And then the second is there's sort of a gap in, on global leadership on climate change at the moment with the U.S. stepping aside. Uh, can the Chinese step up into this role while we're on the sidelines? Uh, Okay, so for those who aren't familiar with this, carbon capture refers to pulling carbon out of the emissions from like a coal plant principally um, uh, or natural gas or even from the ambient air. Um, 
technology called direct air capture. capture. You pull it out, uh, or steel and cement, as you know, Doug is saying, uh, cement. Um, uh, and, and then you either put the carbon dioxide underground or use it in a product of some kind, and that way um, kind of um, prevent it from going to the atmosphere. Um, the, uh, uh, the Chinese government is, is definitely interested in carbon capture, has carbon capture programs, for, particularly for utilization programs, and is looking at different ways to utilize carbon dioxide as an input, like in fuels and cement and this type of thing. And there is some work going on on carbon capture technologies in Chinese universities. It's not a big priority, um, but, but there's been, there's research that's ongoing um, on this. Um, so it's, uh, I'd say it's, it's more in the research stage, there's very little deployment, but there's some, but there's some interest in this. Um, uh, in terms of global leadership, so the Trump administration's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement was an incredible gift to the Chinese leadership in terms of its positioning on climate change. Um, and uh, the Chinese government seized that opportunity in, and President Xi Jinping um, went to Global Fora, including Davos, um, and celebrated uh, the Chinese government's commitment to multilateral leadership uh, on climate change, and it continues to talk about its commitment to multilateral leadership on climate change. Um, uh, I think uh, one thing I've observed is, is um, that there's, a, rob there's a, a strong dialogue in G77 China circles on climate change, which I think it's part of the, there are many reasons the Chinese government from a diplomatic standpoint, um, wants to lead on climate change, but I think that's an important one. And as a, as a I, I have a very clear memory of this, as, and I was a former U.S. Um, official, U.S. government official, and in the 1990s, I was a U.S. government official at these multilateral climate change discussions, and the developing countries would always come up to us and and talk about how bad we were. And I remember, you know, I was part of a team in the U.S. We were trying to. We thought we were trying to do the right thing and trying to reduce emissions and that type of thing, and we would get criticized by developing countries, saying, whatever you're trying to do, it's not working, and, and the U.S. government's the world's leading emitter, and you guys are terrible. Um, and I'll never forget at the 2009 Copenhagen Conference talking to the, a leader from a small island state, and he was criticizing China. And he wasn't criticizing the United States, and I, it was like I'd never heard that before. And, and it was because China, was the world's leading emitter, and they did, you know, his country doesn't care where the emissions come from. They come from China, they come from the United States, they still cause his island to go underwater. And so that type of an antagonism against China because of its emissions is actually pretty strong from some poor developing countries right now, and, and uh, Chinese government um, is not comfortable with that, doesn't, you know, uh, for a variety of diplomatic reasons, and that's a pretty powerful motivator, I think, for the Chinese government. Yeah, maybe I'll just comment on that a little bit. Uh, yeah, the, the G77 is, is definitely a big audience for China, and, uh, and it, it, it was very concerned by criticism it was receiving uh, from not only uh, small island countries but other developing countries. But the small island countries also has an interesting sort of twist because it, uh, wooing them is part of China's effort to woo them away. Many of them were uh, still recognized uh, the Republic of China on Taiwan, and and so wooing them uh, was part of China's effort to squeeze uh, Taiwan's international space. So it has, there's another dimension to this this whole whole uh, uh, dialogue with with small island countries. But uh, yeah, I think uh, what David said is very important. Xi Jinping uh, has been handed this gift uh, and is now uh, speaking at multilateral fora about. Uh, the shared uh, China's uh, role in in uh, leading uh, the um, a shared future for mankind, which is the phrase. It's often uh, it's not really very good English, or uh, a uh, uh, the, the uh, common destiny for mankind is better translated. But uh, China has been uh, on a major sort of uh, China's uh, provide as a provider of global and regional public goods campaign as part of its its uh, its international diplomacy and in fact it can it can uh, make a good case that in the climate arena it is providing you know it is providing more public goods uh, than uh, other leading powers uh, and I, I note that China just met with uh, the Europeans and it, there, of course there are major tensions between China and Europe over BRI right now uh, the Belt and Road Initiative right now but uh, one of the areas of common ground was common 
uh, efforts on climate change. They just wrapped up a meeting in Brussels on this issue. So um, it's, 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 a, it's an important diplomatic tool for China. And uh, it's, it's also a genuinely significant uh, uh, source of, of action for China on, in, in contributing to, to a shared future for mankind. Hi, I'm Lee Beck. I'm a global. Um, I'm a senior advisor at the Global CCS Institute and a um, former SIS alum. Um, thanks so much for the presentations. I have a question um, concerning natural gas. Um, first of all, how do you think LNG or increasing natural gas demand in China will um, affect global LNG markets? And then, second, how much do you think? natural gas is seen as a transition fuel. If we think about the United States, we've always said, you know, gas is the, the bridge to a cleaner future. Um, I think 2018 was the first year that coal to gas fuel switching emissions reductions were outpaced by um, increasing demand satisfied by capacity additions in natural gas. So how far can natural gas deliver emissions redu reductions if we think of zero emissions by 2050. Such important questions. So, um, uh, so first on, on LNG, uh, liquid natural gas imports. So China historically has not been a large importer of natural gas, but in the past couple of years has ramped up very quickly. It's now the second largest importer of natural gas in the world after Japan and is likely to overtake Japan and become the world's largest liquid natural gas importer. So China's fundamental to liquid natural gas markets around the world. Uh, and by the way, uh, just as China's becoming the world's largest importer, the United States is potentially become the world's largest exporter of natural gas. We're not the largest exporter today, but our natural gas exporting capacity is growing dramatically. And so um, once, or if trade war issues can be handled between the United States and China, there is, there's an obvious potential for real deep commercial relationship um, uh, between the United States and China when it comes to liquid natural gas. Um, then in terms of transition fuels um, and its impact on climate change, so you know, for those who are an expert in this, when you burn liquid natural gas, when you, when you burn natural gas of any kind, you get about half the emissions of carbon dioxide as you get from burning coal for the same unit of energy, same amount of energy. So. Um, it really makes a big difference to burn natural gas instead of coal when it comes to fighting global warming. And that's one of the reasons that U.S. power sector emissions have gone down so much in the past 10 years is because we've switched from coal to gas. There's one very important caveat on that, which is that when that natural gas leaks, or if it leaks, then it has very, very negative global warming implications. Um, if it leaks out of a pipeline, it, it, this gets a little bit complicated, but the short-term impacts of, of a molecule of, carbon, uh, of, of natural gas leaking is like 20 to 80 times greater than a, a molecule of carbon dioxide leaking. So you really, really need to be sure that that natural gas that you're using doesn't leak or you've just wiped out the global warming benefit of switching from coal to natural gas. Um, uh, I'm, involved with programs right now with Chinese um, universities and others working on exactly this issue in China to make sure that as Chinese natural gas um, infrastructure scales up, that there's very, very minimal leakage. So this is something the Chinese government is paying attention to um, and is actually being discussed in policy circles in China right now. But it's getting it right is, you know, it, it is really a challenge. Uh, this is not an area I've spent much time working on, so just... Hi, uh, my name is Manja. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I'm a first year EIE student in science, and actually I'm also a former intern at the Center on Global Energy Policy back in China. Oh. I'm working with Yan Shen. Yeah, and I actually Good my question... Good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, uh, you mentioned that China has been developing its renewable energies using mining policies, but I know that uh, there is a huge uh, wind and solar commitment in the west, in the west of China. So, um, well, I think there are some administrative reasons behind it. For example, uh, province in the east they don't want to use uh, power from the west because they want their local 
GDP development, and also because they want more re more stable energy to uh, for, for, to fulfill their goals, their energy targets. So I'm wondering, what's your take on on China's energy, renewable energy in the West, and uh, such as so, so solar and wind, and also what do you think China can do to like, alleviate the problem? Well, that's a very, those are very, very good questions, and I hope you go back to China and work on this problem, because this is, we need, we need experts like you uh, with that type of knowledge to, to work on this issue. Um, uh, the single, I'll make one recommendation. Um, the single most important thing the Chinese government could do is, it would be to have what we call economic dispatch of power in China. Um, and. I know, do you have an energy kind of fundamentals class here, where oh, electricity markets? So if, if you haven't taken that, don't always say, I recommend taking it. But the basic idea is that in, in, um, in the United States, in almost all places, when electricity, when a utility has an option to buy electricity from different sources, it buys the electricity at the lowest marginal cost. And that's called economic dispatch. And the um, lowest marginal cost uh, is almost always going to be solar or wind power if solar or wind power is available because once you've built that facility, it doesn't cost anything when, you know, there's no fuel cost. Um, so it's uh, very, very low, uh, typically. And so if, uh, so solar and wind power, once it's built in the United States, it almost always is used. Um, uh, in China, there's a different system. And in China, in, it's almost exactly the opposite. In most places, coal plants have the priority because coal plants have long-term contracts which guarantee them a certain number of hours uh, to run. Um, and wind and solar only get used after that. Um, and that's been a real problem, particularly with slower than planned economic growth. And, um, and then provinces, as you were saying, wanting to keep the electricity to themselves. Um, so the single biggest change that I think could be made would be a switch to economic dispatch, or sometimes you could, it's called green dispatch um, in China. Then also more, more transmission lines connecting provinces and more trading between provinces would make a big difference too. But it's a really important problem. I, d I would actually just like to ask you, what about, there's a lot of talk about smart grid technology helping some of this. How, yeah. uh, where does that stand? And, uh, what are its um, prospects? So smart grid technology is usually, um, usually more focuses on the distribution level grid, like homes and businesses mm -hmm. and that type of thing, um, than the kind of big wholesale type of electricity I was just talking about. Um, and yeah, so, so um, uh, there's, lot, there's good potential for reducing energy use from efficiency from smart grids, for sure. Um, and you know, China, it's just amazing. Uh, the innovation that's happening in China in general in the area of digital um, and meters and optical sensing and this type of thing, a lot of which can be used for, for energy efficiency. To, um, so it's, there's a lot of potential there. There's, I had, um, uh, so some of you will appreciate this, some of you maybe had this experience, but a student of mine last year, she's, she grew up in China, she'd never been in the United States, and after a couple of weeks in the United States, I was talking with her, and she, uh, I said, you know, how is it? And she said, it's so weird here in the United States. Like, I need to carry around cash or a credit card in order to pay for things. I'm not used to that. Um, and, and for an American, that just seems so funny, you know. But, but the, uh, you know, the innovation in China on mobile pay has just, you know, gotten so pervasive that you don't need to carry around cash or credit cards. Um, and, and that type of innovation is happening in a way that it just, it, you know, it's, it's way ahead of the West in some ways. Um, David, let me ask you a question, if I may, about nuclear power, which is one of my uh, old favorite subjects I used to, to teach about. Uh, what, what's your sense of China's commit, large commitment to nuclear power? Uh, is, there, is it meeting any domestic resistance? And do you have any concerns about nuclear safety in, in China? Um, so the Chinese government's quite committed to building up its civil nuclear power fleet and um, you know, roughly a third of the power plants under construction in the world today are in China. So a very, very significant build is, is going on in China. Some pretty ambitious goals um, over the course of the next 10 years to build up its, its nuclear power fleet. It's also doing research into advanced nuclear uh, reactors. There has been public opposition um, to, to uh, nuclear power plant construction in China. There's, you know, not a lot of visibility on that public 
you know, opposition because of China's political systems and the lack of press freedoms and, and that type of thing, but there has definitely been, um, there has definitely been political opposition um, within China, including local opposition in the construction of nuclear power plants. Um, and, and yes, I think there are concerns about safety. There, um, it's really important to have strong regulatory systems. Um, and uh, there's, um, the, Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese regulators are committed to building those up, but, um, and, and are working with Western regulators um, on shared learning and that type of thing. But, but I think anybody who's paying attention, you know, you can need to be concerned everywhere in the world, including in China, about, the, about that. Just, just a quick uh, footnote there, or note. Uh, uh, after Fukushima in, in Japan, uh, China sort of stopped yeah. it, uh, its rapid um, deployment and building construction of nuclear plants and, and, uh, and, and step back and, and try to address some concerns about, uh, about yeah, nuclear right. safety. But then they're slowly res resuming. Oh, yeah, I think they're 19 yeah. under construction yeah. or something like that, a lot. Yeah, a lot. Anybody else? Here, Mike's coming to you. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hope you'll answer that because I'd like to hear your <laughs> answer. Um, Would you repeat the question? Is not everybody. Uh, the, the question is what what's the impact of, of U.S. China tensions on on energy and climate policy? Um, that's that's a big question. So so first of all, um, there have been some very direct impacts in terms of the trade in energy products. Okay, uh, the, so actually the very first product that the U.S. government imposed tariffs on under the Trump administration as kind of the leading edge of the trade war was, were solar panels. Um, it was actually solar panels and washing machines at the same time. But, it, but solar, solar panels were literally, the, you know, the very first um, product. And um, now, by, by the way, um, it, and, and, and there are actually two different tariffs that have been imposed on solar panels coming from China. There's one set of tariffs that are imposed on solar panels from all around the world, and then some tariffs totally separately imposed specifically on solar panels from China. Um, that has not slowed the sale of, ter of panels to uh, the United States from China that much. It slowed it a little bit, um, partly because there's a glut of, ch of solar panels in the world, and so prices came down. So. So, so, so the solar industry is still growing in the United States despite that. Um, but then in addition, um, the uh, uh, trade war has directly affected the trade of natural gas between the U.S. and China, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, so far that hasn't really affected China's ability to increase its natural gas consumption because China is getting natural gas from other places, okay? but. Um, but the trade war does have the potential to affect the trade in kind of energy products, which could have an impact on, on climate change. Um, then uh, I think the trade war is part of a broader set of um, challenges in the U.S.-China relationship that are making it harder to cooperate across a range of areas. And in the um, last administration, uh, one of the kind of uh, headlines uh, in terms of U.S.-China cooperation was our cooperation on climate change. Um, and I think many observers say that that agreement between President Xi Jinping and, and President Obama on climate change was the foundation for the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Paris Climate Agreement wouldn't have happened without that. Um, and that isn't happening under the current U.S. government, not just because of the U.S.-China trade wars, but also because of the current U.S. government's policies on climate change, right? Um, uh, one important uh, point about that, however, is that um, the, the, in the United States, 
our state governments have an enormous amount of authority with respect to energy policy um, and therefore emissions. And that's, it's often um, difficult to kind of see that. But often when you kind of look at another country from abroad, you only see their national government, you don't see their subnational governments. And you know, Americans do that too. Americans will almost, you know, rarely think about what's, you know, the policy in Hubei or what's the policy in Shanxi or that type of thing. But those can actually be very important with respect to what's happening in China. And same thing in the United States. Um, in, in the United States, our state government policies have been arguably more important than our federal policies on, the, on renewable power, for example. Like we, our renewable portfolio standards have been one of the most important policies for deploying you know, in renewable power in, in this country. Um, and unlike in China, in the United States, our state governments are totally independent of our federal government um, in the sense of they're elected, the leadership is elected separately, they're often political opponents of the federal government, and one of the big areas where there's disagreement right now is on global warming policy. So some of our biggest states, including California and New York, are led by governors who strongly disagree with President Trump's climate change policies and are actively seeking cooperation with China on that topic, in particular California. So the governor, actually just the immediate past governor of California, Governor Jerry Brown, who just left, um, had a number of agreements with Chinese leadership on, on climate change. And if California were a country, California would, I think, be like the seventh largest country in the world or sixth largest country in the world or something like that. So it's you know, pretty significant. And so even in the face of these U.S.-China trade tensions, I think we're <coughs> continuing to see a lot of cooperation on climate change. I just have another tiny point. Just, I think um, I, I read that China is responsible for almost 30 percent of all patents and renewables. Uh, and so there was really robust uh, cooperation on on development of, you know, in, in, in development of new technologies between the two countries, and a lot of that has been curtailed because of concerns about, uh, um, uh, you know, genuine, legitimate concerns in this country about intellectual property, but also some other concerns just about the nature of of the Chinese government. Uh, anybody else? Uh, if not, I think we'll close at this point, and we do have a little reception for those of you who, who could stay on uh, for a glass of wine and some more conversation. But please uh, join me in, in thanking our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.